Okay, we're just after the top of the hour, and I, in respect for everybody's time, I would like to get started. Welcome. My name is Kevin Raybon. I'm the founder and chairman of the Global Sales Operations Association, and you have uh, tuned into our first in a series webinar, this series that we're, we're calling Planning and Preparing for 2021. In this, first, um, in this first installment of our webinar series, we have a panel of experts who will be sharing with you um, how to avoid some common pitfalls that uh, could come into your way as you are planning for 2021. And I'm excited to have this group. Uh, we've spent some time together. Many of these people are people I've known for years. And uh, I know that the quality of this discussion is going to be very good. And, um, you know, in sales operations, it's important that you have a very good network of people uh, that you can rely on, people that you trust. And uh, these are four wonderful people that I want to introduce you to because they've meant a lot to me. Uh, the, the four people are, the first is uh, Dr. Joel Shapiro. And Dr. Shapiro is an expert on helping organizations generate value with data analytics. He consults on how to scale enterprise-wide analytics, expertise, and develop profitable analytics investments and strategies. Joel is a professor at Northwestern University, and he serves as the Chief Analytics Officer at Verison. Joel, would you say hi to the group? i going to take myself off mute. Hello. Good to be here. And then second, I have Anshul Gupta. Anshul has been helping to maximize the potential for sales force effectiveness, sales performance man uh, management, and business analytics programs for over 26 years. Anshul spent some time with Deloitte, and currently Anshul serves as the VP of Industry Solutions at Verisent. Anshul. Hi, everyone. Excited to be here. The next on our panel is Dave Edelman. Dave works with a variety of clients on sales strategy, sales operations, performance management, and sales compensation. He has over 20 years of experience consulting with global 2000 companies in a multiple industry uh, verticals. Dave's a frequent speaker on sales compensation and sales effectiveness issues. And Dave serves in the role of principal at the Alexander Group's Atlanta office. Thanks for having me. I'm glad you're here. And finally on the panel, we have Robert Blum. Robert has a long and impressive record of achieving business and sales goals in gro high growth and emerging organizations. And Rob serves as the senior vice president at Open Symmetry, Open Symmetry, where he brings over 20 years of experience in sales effectiveness, sales performance, and technology to the consulting projects that his firm performs for Fortune 100 companies. Rob. Yeah, hey, thanks, Kevin. Good to be here as well. Well, I'm glad that you guys are here to address the group. You know, over the course of the last six months, at this, as this whole world has been turning over so quickly, uh, the membership in our organization has had a lot of questions. And one of the things that they've really had questions on is how do we prepare for 2021? Uh, none of us saw 2020 coming. Um, and so the planning that we did for 2020 was very much incremental planning. It was dusting off things that we had done for years and years and making some adjustments and substituting some new variables in and saying, here's our plan for 2020. So one of the pitfalls that uh, I think that we could address is how do we, now that we cannot really rely on those historical patterns um, that we've had before, you know, if, if we're relying on those, we could fall into a pit as we're planning for 2021. So the first question really goes to you, Anshul. It's, you know, planning in the current context is very tricky. Uh, from, our, from your experience as a practitioner and as an advisor, what words of wisdom could you share with our audience about this type of environment and how to conduct yourself? Thanks, Kevin. Uh like you said, it this this is unprecedented, unique. Call it like whatever adjective you want to give. Uh, and you're right. the The planning has to be has to be on on top of its game right now. This year has told us more than any others that the planning has to be adaptive. It has to be collaborative, and it has to be efficient. Nobody thought Black Friday is going to be canceled. Nobody thought you know Walmart's going to not be operating twenty four hours or or so on. So you have to plan for internal and external influence factors, and you have to keep these multiple models because you may have to switch from one to the other. What you know now might change in the next hour, might definitely is going to change tomorrow. So that's the first one. Um, revenue growth in my mind is, is way more important than ever than sales growth. You have to think of cost avoidance. You have to think of areas where you can, you can reduce your costs. And in that, you have to evaluate your territory balance over and under allocation for fairness. 
um, because you may have to switch people, you may have to switch territories. So again, achieving that balance, achieving that fairness uh, that assists in continuous planning is critical. And I think the, the third thing that comes to my mind is uh, customer segmentation is critical more than ever. Uh, you have to account for you know, various uh, demographics, for instance, minorities and baby boomers may be more impacted by, uh, by a medical condition. Somebody else, a restaurateur might be more impacted by economic conditions. So those to my mind are the key things, adaptive, collaborative, efficient planning, keeping in mind the factors, revenue and, and fairness, uh, revenue growth and, growth and fairness of territories and segmentation um, emphasis on that. I love it. I mean, the adaptive, having multiple models, you know, I know that sometimes it's hard for, it was hard for me to come up with just one or two models. And, and it sounds like what you're suggesting is that, that we actually go into this year with several different options as to way this, the, the way mm -hmm. this could turn out. Um, and pre-plan for some of that. Is that what you're really telling us to do with these adaptive models? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, and and then when it comes to to balancing territories, I noticed you you mentioned you know balancing for fairness and, and balancing for um, you know for for maximizing potential. Um, any suggestions on 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 ways to go about doing that, or or things to keep top of mind when you're trying to balance for fairness and for maximizing opportunity? I think with with Dr. Joel, uh, Dr. Shapiro on on there, I'm I'm going to be probably way under uh, underwhelmed on on that answer. But um, like I said, <clears throat> keeping a track of all the factors that are there and not just not just the ones that we typically know, not just the organizational knowledge, because organizational knowledge is really out the door at this point. Mm -hmm. But keeping the factors that are there, but also the external, the edge influencers that may be there, whether it's weather, it's shutdowns, whether it is reassignment of, you know, there, there might be things going on in your particular area because of, because of demonstrations. All these factors have to be kept in mind as well when we're balancing, because like I said, you may have to trade, um, uh, you may have to trade people in and out for whatever reason because mm -hmm. of conditions that are well beyond anyone's control. So, so keeping those factors and then using these models, what happens if I, if I toggle the medical factor up, if I put the you know, shutdown factor higher or lower, um, shutdown due to demonstrations higher or lower, all those uh, would become very critical. Very good, I, I appreciate that. And you know, um, the ones that of us that have been on the panel here that have been in the business for 15, 20 years, this isn't the first hiccup we've seen in the business cycle, maybe the deepest, uh, most unexpected one, but there have been other hiccups to the business cycle. And, and like in 20, uh, 2008, there was some impact uh, to the overall business climate in the world um, in 2008. And this next question really goes to Dave. Uh, Dave, you guys operate globally and you've been involved in strategy projects and compensation projects and, and sales performance projects. Um, throughout all of this time, are there any lessons that your clients and, and your firm has learned that came out of 2008 that we need to be reminded of as we go into and through this, this time that we're in now? Well, I think we'd, we'd much rather have the 2008 uh, banking meltdown than a global pandemic, that's for sure. But I think there, is a, there are a subset of, of sort of band-aids that, that we have seen some commonality there. And I think it all goes to that, you know, if quota or goals are just deemed unattainable due to the pandemic. There's, there's a, you know, an outreach to try to protect sellers and protect seller pay. So things like pay guarantees or draws, quota relief is another one, uh, <clears throat> design formula changes, especially when it comes to the sales compensation payout curves all the stuff to the left where you had thresholds or soft thresholds, hard thresholds, seen a lot of changes there. Uh, another sort of 2008 trick that's of, of late is sort of the stack ranking. You remember when you, you, know, you took physics and the mean was 62, but somehow that was a B plus, right? So we, we're looking at territories and reps and, and seeing how they compare. It's another way to protect seller pay and, and, make, it, you know, and make it not so bad. Um, and last but not least is sort of this emergence of the MBOs or activity man management by objectives and activity based metrics. Um, that's just because, you know, we got a lot of folks, you know, behind cameras and a different coverage model like we are today. Uh, that 
was not present in 2008. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. I think we had the swine flu back there somewhere, but people weren't confined, you know, to their to their offices. So in terms of some analogs, we have seen some tricks to again to protect sellers. Although a lot of that is sort of we're waiting till the end of 2020 because a lot of these quotas and a lot of this goaling is is you know reconciled at the end of the year. And now sort of thinking about 2021, what kind of stickiness is there? Right. And mm-hmm. I think a lot of that's probably not in the Band-Aids in 2008 and sales comp, but rather this sort of disrupted uh, coverage model. Right. These roles where you have the classic field B2B seller is gone. Right. Mm-hmm. And it may not appear until the second half or maybe not at all. Twenty one. Who knows? We you know, if we knew that we wouldn't be sitting here. Right. So that that is really going to be um, um, the bigger planning issue and the and and how to make new metrics and how to have different expectations and again the the evolution of digital so there's a lot there in the coverage piece to answer your question kevin that we haven't seen before and i think that's the big impact on planning the comp piece and eh, you know we're we're doing the best we can and some companies are doing a lot more than others so right. i'll just up there but those have been sort of the what's the same and what's not the same so so one of the things i'm hearing you say is one of the things that i see too which is in this the whole we were already in a phase where the, the customers were buying differently. We, and many companies would started to adjust to that and move more people to the inside sales roles or maybe even split up the different roles in sales to SDRs and BDRs and, and various different forms of salesperson instead of having a, a single purpose seller or just saying field and inside, right? But now all of a sudden, like you're saying, we've all been forced to deal with this, this new virtual selling mo- mode. You know, um, as people start looking at the, the roles that they may need for the coming year, any advice on, um, you know, how they, how they could um, approach that problem of determining whether or not they really do need new roles, or is it really just a new skill set that they need for their same people they have today? No, that, that's a phenomenal, that's a really good question. I think, I think for us, a lot of it has been on sort of more of the hunting and new client acquisition, new logo type of selling. That's where it's you know, where you, you think in your classic models where you need to go out and develop the relationship to acquire new customers, that's the hardest piece. So if I'm a hybrid B2B seller, how is that piece going to happen? Although we do have some runway here because we're in a recovery. The farming piece, the account management, the GAMs, the global account managers, strategic account managers, those folks, it's a lot easier because they already have the relationship with Dave and everybody's sort of stuck at home. So I think it's it's really that piece that is 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 less known on how successful that's going to be. And I guess the last thing I'll say is now we've got first line sales managers, the first line management team, probably older, probably more entrenched in the B2B in person. And now they're in, they're kind of stuck with coaching this as well. It's like, well, how do we go out and get new customers without sitting in a conference room? So mm-hmm. uh, I think there's new definitions. Uh, new proportions and and a lot of like I said a lot of new you know metrics especially when it comes to to activity based metrics that we're seeing to attack this problem and also learning as quickly as we can as a lot of these companies are, are actually recovering now on what's going to stick and what's not going to stick. Excellent, thank you for that. You know. Um... Our next question, it really goes to Joel, and this is on our second topic, which is another pitfall that we feel that you could fall into in in preparing for 2021 is using rigid systems and data that still has gaps uh, could keep us from moving quickly or moving in an agile way, right? So, you know, um, many of us were caught, you know, still still dealing with the gaps in our data and the the rigidity of our systems, and now we have to be more agile than ever, and that's a that's a major challenge for a lot of companies. And we got a, a, a wonderful person on the on the line here who can help us address that. And I, I'm going to send this one to Joel. Yeah, you know, Joel, from the discussion so far, we've heard that prior planning methods are really much less reliable than before, and, and members are telling me that their existing systems, data, and analytics are fairly rigid. They're purpose built around historical management methods. Methodologies. What advice do you have for a person in our audience today who, who really wants to use data as a decision-making tool in a, in a new agile way? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. Um, <clears throat> look, as a so as a business school professor, um, I get kind of the cool experience of getting to work with lots of different companies, you know, within sales, not in sales, right? Lots of, of interesting people and lots of different organizations. And there's a very very common trend that I see that I think speaks very much to the heart of your question. Whenever I start talking to a business team or a leader about their use of analytics, 
the first person that somebody starts, the first thing that somebody starts talking uh, to me about are like the IT tools, and they show me these really pretty IT, uh, these pretty um, data dashboards, sometimes some not very pretty reports that they get, and they say things like, you know, we have a ton of data, real competitive advantage for us. Well, time out everybody has a ton of data, right? Competitive advantage right now isn't on how much data you have, it's really on how you use it. And so I'll sort of turn that back to them and I'll say, you know, look, tell me about the kinds of problems that you're trying to solve with data and how you're using data. And that's kind of where things break down a lot of the times, right? If you can't articulate what problem you're trying to solve or what question you're trying to answer with data, then you are sunk right out of the gate. And, and this is a real handicap for a lot of people. You know, you've got no chance of winning with analytics because you don't know what direction you're heading. You've got a ton of information. You don't know how to really prioritize or analyze any of it. But if you can tell me what you're trying to do, even getting people to sort of figure out how they're gonna use the data can be a challenge. They'll say things like, I'm trying to optimize our team for maximum performance. Well, great, of course you are. but how are you actually doing that? How are you actually analyzing the data that you have to make that happen? Something like optimization, crazy hard mathematically to do. So what are you actually doing with the data to bring real value? And so you asked me for advice. So look, number one, you always got to be crystal clear on what problem you're trying to solve or what question you're trying to answer. That's like table stakes, right? But the other thing is that there are some really good, more advanced analytics tools that go beyond backwards looking dashboards, right? Things like machine learning and AI. And I know that some people think immediately AI is really futuristic and not within reach, but AI is really nothing more than letting computers do the heavy lifting of sorting through data and finding trends that help us do something better. You know, when we use tools that are machine learning or AI like, typically we can do a better job of predicting what's gonna happen with our customers, sales teams, markets, whatever it is. And granted, that gets harder when we have something like what we're living through right now, right? It is a, a blip, hopefully it's a short blip, right? Um, but when we can predict more accurately what's gonna happen, when we can just be a little smarter about what's likely to happen, we can be a lot more effective at our planning. Mm -hmm. And I'll just sort of, wrap this up. I'm getting a little long-winded here, I know, but heck, I'm a professor. I'm used to having the stage, I suppose. Um, look, prediction allows us to do typically two different things. Either we can plan for what's going to happen, or we can anticipate what's going to happen and then try and keep bad things from happening, right? right? Rather than wait to not hit our sales goal, something like an AI tool can help us identify where the problem spots are. And the sooner we know that, the sooner we can intervene. So I think be crystal clear about what it is that you're trying to do. Be crystal clear about how the data are going to inform your action and make sure that you're using sort of the state of the art tools that can allow you to um, really, as I like to say, generate business value. And, and just be cautious though, right? Technology is never, um, technology is a means to better business decisions. The output of a nice analytic model is never going to help you if you rely on the data to make the decisions for you, right? It always is an input into uh, a smart business person's critical thinking process. Well, Jill, that's that's great. And, and I know from what you do at Northwestern that you have a passion for, for teaching and growing people's capabilities, especially younger people who are, who are new to the career and want to develop. They're aspirational, right? So many of our members in Sales Ops Association actually fit that category. There are people who started in sales operations and they may have come from a finance background or they may have come from an IT background where they were babysitting the CRM and, and they were that report writer person. Right. But now they want to get to the next level in their career. And what I think I find is that it, it comes down to those questions that you mentioned. So do you have some advice for that person that's in that area in their career where they really want to grow their business acumen and they want to understand the business better so they can ask those questions and move from being that kind of that report writer to the person who eventually is kind of the consigliere for the chief revenue officer who's sitting there helping to advise and, and, and look and ask the right questions. Do you have any advice for a person who might want to move their career in that path, that path and, and where they could go to, to, to do that? Um, yeah. So look, I, I mean, my bias is always towards, you know, education is really helpful, right? There's a reason why I love being in it. And so, you know, people get um, different kinds of training from different places, of course, right? There are lots of great 
online short courses that they can do. I mean, we are helping people at Verison, you know, sort of see these kinds of um, trends and we're doing some, you know, sort of light training ourselves. But, you know, I think the key is wherever you seek it out, a lot of times people, I think, sort of make a mistake, like, oh, I want to be involved in analytics, so I'm going to go learn to write code. Okay, fine. That isn't, you know, necessarily where you need to head with it, though. To me, it's always about finding the right ways to sort of marry up the analytics with the business problem. Um, you know, businesses are still light on that, right? They still sort of rely on the dashboards and just sort of assume that things are going to get better because it's trivially easy to take, you know, really pretty dashboards and turn them into action. It's not. It is actually really complicated. And so, you know, I think more and more experience with, you um, Building and it, it, building is the wrong word. Interpreting these models is really good. There's some really good, like I said, online courses that you can find from you know, a wide range of places. There's formal education that people can you know go to. But um, to me, it's about having the business experience, not the analytics experience. That's where I think people should focus on. Because at the end of the day, you don't want to build the best model possible. At the end of the day, you want to build the most valuable model possible, and those are not necessarily one and the same. Right. I think you and I are seeing something common and that is the, the, the gap or the big need for a, a translator, that person who can sit there and be that translator from between the data and the business challenges and, and go back and forth to, to really drive the value out of those discussions. So, yeah, I mean, I, I teach I teach data scientists who love building the most accurate model possible. That's fun. But oftentimes the most accurate model isn't necessarily the most business helpful. And knowing how to distinguish among those is pretty important. Right. Well, thanks for that. I think the audience really benefits from what, from your perspective. And, you know, the next question goes to Rob. You know, we're still in the area of systems and data. And, and one of the issues I've always had is that even in a normal year, we, uh, we get our plan designs set so late that implementing our changes um, in, in order to have them ready for January 1st is, is always a foot race. And so we all know that planning and analysis phase this year is likely going to be very protracted. What advice can you give our audience around sequencing and preparing for that foot race to implement the new requirements in the system that they have for managing compensation and sales performance? Yeah, no, that's, a, that's always a fun one every year, right? Um, when comp plans come out, you know, worst case scenario, they throw it over the wall and they expect the folks that administer the compensation plans to get them up and running, you know, yesterday. And I, I think there's there's obviously some lessons learned there, right? Um, you know, there is an opportunity to align your uh, administrative team, the people that are responsible for the configuration management of those plans with the planning uh, conversation. So the more you can uh, sort of bridge that gap, if you will, between those two groups, I think the better off you're going to be. Um, you know, there's a lot of even initial conversations that are going to help your administrators or the folks that, that configure your compensation plans and the systems uh, some insight, right, into where you're going. And, and I'll give you a great example. We have a client right now that's going through a, a sizable implementation. Well, uh, you know, this is a multi-year engagement. And, and when COVID hit, uh, you know, they were scrambling, right? And, and a, lot of the, a lot of the challenges came down to, uh, you know, how do we accurately uh, design quotas that will, you know, that, that are accurate, right? And, and, and will give these people uh, an opportunity to be successful. And what they ended up doing is they end up going from annual quotas to quarterly quotas. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a, a little bit of a scramble right in the middle of the year. And so the configuration team had to adjust, right? And they had to set up, a, you know, a temporary workaround to, so that they could pay people and, and track and, and uh, percent of goals against these quarterly. Well, again, that's a bit of an extreme, but if you know your company's headed different directions, right, for 2021, you know, say per per se, if you get your feet underneath you this year and you kind of have some ideas of things you can do for next year, well, the sooner you can have those conversations with the people that are going to be managing those compensation plans and administering them, I think the better off they're going to be, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, so if you think you're going to shorter uh, quota uh, calendars or things like that, or you're going to pay off of this metric versus this metric, or, you know, even to Joel's points about, you know, what are the business challenges you're going to try to address and look at within the, the, the design of your compensation plan, all those things, the, the sooner they become more apparent to the folks that are going to be managing those plans, the better off they're going to be in addressing, you know, how they're going to implement those plans in the, in the system. And, there, and another, another path that I think folks can take is oftentimes, you know, companies will do some sort of an assessment of their plan designs, you know, on an annual basis where they'll look at the plans and say, hey, are they, are they driving the right behavior? Obviously, it's a bigger conversation now. 
but you can do that same thing for your system, right? And, mm-hmm. and, and the program, and you can say, hey, do we have the right reports in place? Do we have the right dashboards in place? Are we putting the right data into the system? You know, have we set up the calendar in a way so that it's going to be flexible and, and allow us to do the things we want to do in 2021? Those are all good conversations to have now. And, and, and again, the more you can bring the people into the conversation sooner, I think the better, uh, the better chance you have of being successful when it comes time to, to stand these plans up for 2021 and, and, and get them tested and rolled out. Yeah, great points. You know, the, and what you said, I think really rings true for me because the data feeds that we had and the basic calculations that we've always had for our different plans where I've been, they don't really change that much every year. The systems that are our source systems are always our source systems and those aren't going to change so fast. But it's always whenever we had that last minute um, twist by the sales leaders or the finance team uh, where they thought it would be a small innocuous change. Oh, let's just pay that quarterly. <laughs> and right, then they see right. the frightened look by everybody on our team because we're like, uh, that's huge. <laughs> um, and, and what I would oh, what I really would suggest for people on the call is get proactive about the types of things that you know are difficult um, for, for, for you to calculate today and address those questions or those possibilities that those could come up uh, with your leaders ASAP and maybe even put a priority score on this is level one difficult, two, three, and nearly impossible. You know, give them a level of understanding. But instead of this year being maybe reactive about how you take the requirements to go implement, be quite a bit more proactive about approaching your sales and finance leaders with options um, because they're going to listen to, to webinars like this and they're going to hear things from other organizations that talk about sales plan design and things that they're going to do to hold on to teams and they're going to come to you. So it'd be better if you were educated on that and could and go ahead and bring some of those things to, to, to light early so you could know which way you might need to point uh, your development team. So that, that's, those are some of my thoughts. Any, is that sound about right, uh, Rob? Yeah, no, no, for sure. For sure. I mean, it, it doesn't matter if you're on a homegrown, you're on Excel, or you're one of these third party applications. Uh, it does take time to reconfigure those things, you yeah. know, and, and the, the, the third party systems, and I think Ansel and some of the folks on the, on the call would, would attest to, are designed to enable business users to make those changes easier, faster, quicker, whatever you want to call it. But when you're making significant changes to the, to the architecture of your program, give yourself some time. That's, that's all I can, all I can offer. Right. I mean, I, I don't know, Ansel, do you have any thoughts on this or? You're absolutely correct, Rob. The biggest thing is that your, your platform should allow for the flexibility. Like I said, early on, you're absolutely correct that it should be adaptive. Your planning should be adaptive. And as a result, your, your, your uh, tool, your platform, your solution has to support that flexibility and yes, most of these tools are, um, are designed for the business to take control, not just give everything to technology, but at the same time, the right implementation, the right approach in these tools is also going to be critical. And, and Rob's point is very fair. Uh, you know, people have gone from annual to quarterly, maybe even more. So the organizations that were used to shorter term planning or more creative planning probably are going to be a little more successful in the in the immediate run uh, than the ones that we're doing annual and, and longer uh, forecasting. Great. Yeah, and I, I just I don't know if I could ask a question, Dave, but you know, are you seeing that, Dave? Are you seeing people shift uh, periods around and 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 I mean, because it has a huge impact on usually the systems, you know, uh, downstream. <laughs> Yeah, no, it, I was just going to say that as a matter of fact. I mean, uh, talking about the 2008 and uh, how disruptive this has been to the coverage model and to the roles, uh, I can imagine that we're having a 2x, 3x uh, number of companies that are actually changing their plans because, you know, we, we've written a couple of McGraw Health textbooks about this subject. The first thing we had to figure out is what is the job role? Well, the job roles have changed quite a bit. So you're going to get changes. And also, I think you need some runway to figure out, use as much as this recovery in 2020 as you can to figure out, all right, this is what we're going to settle on. So my guess is that you're going to get these inputs to these changes later. My guess is that you're going to be releasing plans, and then you ought not do this, but you're going to be releasing, you know, not Jan 1, but more like February because of the inputs are slowed into the changes pieces. So yeah, a great question that everything is changing. So how can we not change 
up and quote us, right? That's, it's just a matter of, you know, when we get our act together. So usually it's a collaboration, HR, finance, and sales operations, right? So I think sales operations can take the leader and say, hey, look, we know it's changing. Let's get on it. Let's get ahead of the curve um, because we've got to make these, these structural changes. I don't know if that, that's useful, but I, I see a lot of changes happening with a lot of our clients in terms of design because of the pandemic. Yeah, we're we're seeing a lot of it, even in even in our our, our ongoing implementations. There, you know, the business leadership is coming out and saying, "Well, I know we said this before, but you know, we're we're looking at some models, and I think this is something we want to adjust." You know, so yeah, it's 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 being being able to be dynamic. I think is the 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 call sign here. Yeah, you know, one of the reasons to be so dynamic is is people are very concerned about losing their sales team. Um, you know, this is our, our third pitfall. Um, we don't want to get into 2020 and lose our sales team. Now, what I'm seeing from talking to my members is many of them have been forced to pare back their sales team. Um, most of them have been protecting the best people that they have. And this has kind of been a, a normal attrition just sped up because of this, um, this, this time that we're in. But for the people that remain, they're really concerned that, that, that they don't they don't lose them. So, so Dave, part of the reason for that is that, you know, they're, they're looking hard at the roles on their sales teams, like we've talked about. And, 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 um, and another reason is that they've had to, they've had to cut and they're, they're facing the same or growing revenue goals just with a smaller team. So what measures are your clients taking or considering uh, to take that to keep their sales teams motivated um, going into the year and so that they don't lose the people that, that they really value? Yeah, no, it's it's um, it's a great question. I'm off you mute here. Um, nothing makes a sales leader more nervous when you talk about threatening their top performers. And um, so, uh, yeah, there's there like as I said before, I don't know why my camera's going kind of fuzzy here. There it is. Um, you know, there's there's been as I said earlier, sort of this emergent of the of the MBOs, right? The management by objectives, because we're really not sure what to do. And I think this is again sort of a a, a band aid to help save the, the, the pay and, and therefore, to your question, help save the high performers. Um, you know, we had an old saying at the Alexander Group, you know, just say no to the MBO. And the reason we say that is because it's not performance-based. We're actually not paying somebody to close business, to, to influencing them to buy something, but rather, you know, the number of emails, the number of chats, the number of meetings, the number of customer workshops, how well you cleaned up your CRM, all this stuff that's now... So you're asking me about new measures are sort of going into the plans. And we've had, the, we've had about 2,000 people on, on these webinars talking about what the heck to do. Some very heated conversations says, I don't care. I will not give these MBOs out to sellers. They're going to, you know, even in the pandemic and behind a the camera, they're going to sell. So I think um, there has been some softening on this, and we're actually recommending that. And again, I think the, the danger is it's a gimme. Right. Oh, OK, I had I had 14 emails or 14 tech demos this week. And, you know, it's not really performance based. So that's sort of the downside. But to your point, the good thing is now I can get that. You know, It's not a, a, a steep pay for performance curve, but it's it's saving the good folks that I really want to save. Uh, it's it's a way to put in new measures. And oh, by the way, I still don't have enough stickiness to figure out how fast this recovery is going to happen in 2021. It's a good way to sort of to, to, to sort of lessen the pay mix, right? If I have a 60, 40 pay mix, I do 20% MBOs. We really made this thing kind of lethargic and that's okay, right? Because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to send a signal that says uh, we don't really know and, and that may be okay too. So uh, that, those are the kind of measures that we're, we're starting to see with one and then sort of the weighting of the measures. You know, it sounds to me like it, it, as with many things in comp, it comes down to communication and, and, and helping the the person who's on the plan really understand that the logic behind why they got handed this one this year, right? And so for the people who do come out with this methodology that you're talking about that uses MBOs when they normally wouldn't do it, it sounds like it's really critical for them to message properly and say, look, you're getting this. And oh, by the way, don't expect this forever, right? Because we're going to go back to reality at some point, but we value you so much that we want to give you something to help protect your earnings, but to also help you, um, begin to develop some of those things we don't normally have time for in a regular year. We may not have so much time for prospecting. We may not have so much time for data hygiene or personal development, but this is so critical to us this year that we really need you to do this. And so we're going to make it worth your time. You're not going to have an MBO forever because we're going to be out of this. But, uh, you know, so 
if you don't have that communication with your team, you're missing out and you're setting yourself up for that problem because that person who enters this year into your sales team and it has an MBO and the next year doesn't is going to freak out because they're not going to understand it. Right. So uh, really good point. And I think it says a lot about the philosophy of the firm as well, the philosophy of the sales leadership and even the, the C-suite on, you know, we, we care, we are trying to protect you. And to your point, um, it's not forever. It's, it's just what we're doing the first half of the full year 2021. Now, the well, tendency I, in these times is to talk about, you know, th these, these challenges of keeping people and protecting their pay, but there are some industries and some places where we're having to evaluate those stressors on the other side of our plan around, you know, do we, is this considered bluebird times? Is this, should we even consider performance caps where we've never had them before? Because the demand is off the charts for some of these industries. What are you saying to people on that side um, of this situation who are really riding the wave um, that we're all feeling like is about to bury some of us? <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got a couple of clients like that. They're in the virtualization business and uh, boy, happy times. Great to talk to those folks. <laughs> I mean, they're, 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 and, and some of them have hit their full number by the end of, of 2Q. Uh, so it, it's just another you know, dimension of the problem. Uh, it's uh, again, good problems to have in general um, but a lot of those caps and deacceleration of payout curves, a lot of that's going to happen on both sides of the fence. Um, but you, you, you just deal with it and then you've got all the legal issues that, you know, you can't really take pay away that was instituted in the plan. Um, so again, <laughs> good, good problems to have. <laughs> Very good. Anybody want to yeah, elaborate I, on, on this one? I, I wouldn't mind sort of just uh, jumping in here for a second, if I can, you know, one of the things that I think is um, underestimated when it comes from a, a data perspective is that one of the things analytics is awesome at is helping people establish uh, a foundation of evidence of business practices that are actually effective, knowing what works. And when you start talking about, you know, making changes in a given year or, you know, wanting to make sure that you keep your most valuable salespeople, that is an opportune time to do some really strategic measurement around what works. Mm -hmm. um, you know, oftentimes we look at people um, who look back words and try and, you know, correlate things and say, oh, we did this and it seemed to have an uptick, but it's really hard to isolate, like, did this business initiative cause this good outcome? And so in a time of movement and turmoil, when you're moving levers around, that can be a really, really nice time to do something a little bit more rigorous. Um, who knows if something that works today to keep a seller is still going to work, you know, post COVID. That's a course, a good and open question, but you know, I'm a big fan of taking changes and analyzing them rigorously to see, Hey, can we get some really good evidence to see how what we did differently resulted in different business outcomes for better, for worse, for neutral, but, you know, get rid of the stuff that doesn't work, do more of the stuff that does and like build a portfolio of stuff that works over time. Uh, that makes great sense. And, you know, we're about to go on to our fourth topic in the pitfalls. And before I do, I'd, I'd like to talk to the audience and say, you know, we're going to have some time here at the end to answer questions. And so um, we're all pretty familiar today with how Zoom works, but it, go to the Q&A section in, in the Zoom application there. If you have a question for the group, we'd love to, to see it. Um, we will get to as many of those as we can in our time that we've got together. And anything that we don't get to, we'll get answered after, after the call. We'll follow back up with you. So uh, before we move on to the final topic, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A and, and we'll get to those after we get through this topic. So, you know, our fourth uh, pitfall is, um, has to do with preparing to sell in this new virtual selling world that we're in. Um, if we are not um, preparing our teams for this new way of selling, it could be a problem for us in the coming year. So, so this question is really to Ansho, and it's, you know, the, the shifting customer journey due to this pandemic has really forced us to look at the roles that people play on our sales team. And it's also caused many people to realize they have some skill development needs for their teams. And so what new or improved skills would you recommend that we be bringing to our sales teams and then I have a heart for sales managers too. Uh, I think they oftentimes go overlooked. So is there anything we need to be preparing our sales managers for to be able to manage in this new time where the selling cycle and the buyer journey are, are different than we might have seen in a while? Absolutely. So I think that, that probably is hitting the nail on the head. The salespeople, traditional sales may have changed. I wouldn't say as far as, uh, you know, going as far as saying that it's dead, but definitely changed big time, like you said. I think Dave, Joel, um, uh, Rob, they've all mentioned different aspects of it. The salesperson 
has very little time to make new connections, to create a new relationship. So they have to be ready as opposed to a firm handshake and meeting somebody over a game or a dinner. That, that time right now is not, you know, it's not available. So uh, you have to be camera or phone ready. You have, your message has to be very crisp. It has to be, you, you've got very little time. And the customer has very little time for any kind of like, call it recreational shopping. So the delivery of the messages has to be very crisp. You can't take your time in building that relationship as you could earlier, right? Um, so it's very targeted. The message has to be crisp and, and the organization has to enable that salesperson who could travel, you know, get in a car and travel anywhere to be that camera or phone ready. Um, the other thing I think is whether you're in, uh, you know, a B2B or a B2C sales environment, um, I think somebody used the term creative empathy is more important than ever. So you have to know your customer if you can somehow do the research, if they've been in a medical hardship, if they've been in a financial hardship and, and right-sizing that sale. I mean, think of it, everybody, everybody used to be very ready for Apple's new devices coming out. This year, the first poll that I came, saw coming out of that, that, uh, that uh, session was, do you think this is the right time to launch a $1,200 or $1,600 phone? Nobody's ever asked that question of Apple before and, and people were ready to pay that price, right? Mm -hmm. so, so the thinking has shifted. So the salesperson has to be ready. They have to, to have that empathy with the customer. Um, on the flip side, like you said, management, yes, absolutely we feel for them. Everything has, everything used to be, there was a top-down number that an organization had. There was a financial plan that everybody had and it was pushed down. Very few organizations were doing a bottom-up approach, but now the sales team has to provide, the, the sales manager has to take that evidence-based bottom-up incorporate that, that number into their sales planning because these sales teams, the people who are, call it feet on the street, they know what the reality of their accounts, their customers, mm -hmm. their even their biggest accounts um, is. And that's why that bottom-up number has to be tied into what the new plan is. And then the other thing is, I think, not just sales managers, but the sales executives, mm -hmm. the executives in general, they have to empower their sales team um, to, to, to bridge the short-term crises for the customer. I mean, be flexible. The organizational policies may be to, you know, be creative with how you carried your debt, how you created your relationships uh, with, with, with your both longtime customers, as well as ones that you're trying to make a relationship with. And I think that the last point that I wanna drive on this one is, uh, yes, there is less opportunity. There is less opportunity to look at data, and, and applications and so on. But then at the same time, the expense dollars that everybody used to have are not being spent anymore. So how do we take that time that is not being spent in traveling? How do we take the expenses that are no longer there mm -hmm. to, to now empower the sales organization to make it better for them and to make that planning process a lot better? I think those are some of the key points that come to my mind. Yeah, that, that, those really ring true with our audience, I'm sure. I've had those discussions with some of the people already on this call. Um, you know, one of the things that also comes up is um, we're having to do things differently. Um, and we're, we're putting some new systems in. I think a lot of people have raced to um, up the uh, investment in the time horizon for some of their um, uh, sales productivity tools that they've that they've. Um, been wanting to put in place and I'm seeing many companies, you know, rapidly begin to implement things. So Joel, the next question is for you. Does this shift in um, how we go to market and how we sell and the new activities that we're doing, it just strikes me that there might be an opportunity to track some things that, that we've not tracked before that could um, help us even now and into the future. Any thoughts about, you know, the digital exhaust that we're all creating now because of some of these new tools and how it could be useful? Yeah, I think you are, are spot on with that. I mean, as a general rule, 
things tend to be a little bit easier to measure and track when they are embedded in a digital environment as opposed to when they happen, you know, person to person or sort of out there in the ether. So, you know, everything about the kinds of interactions, the kind of language that's used, all those things, at least in theory, are trackable. And it starts to build a body of evidence of, you know, stuff that actually works to help us, you know, help us be better. You know, and I, I go back to what I said a minute ago, right? When we go into a new environment, like, you know, this more digital selling uh, forward world, there's a set of practices that I don't know that there's a, a huge amount of rigorous evidence about what works. I mean, I just came off a cool project with a huge financial services company that everyone on this call knows about. And they had this new platform and they wanted to rigorously measure what it did to their sales. And it was pretty cool. They saw a big dip when they implemented this new sales platform and then a slow recovery of sales, you know, relative to, you know, a, a control group that wasn't using the platform and so forth. And it wasn't an easy thing to go about measuring that, but it's a super cool and super important way of looking at the data because all of a sudden what they realize is, oh, look, the reason that there was a dip is because we had implementation problems. Technology worked great, but the salespeople didn't really know how to use it. And was that dip worth the eventual uptick? And how can we reduce the implementation time so there's less of a dip? Like all of those things can, and in my mind, should be measured so that you're not sitting here, you know, five years from now saying, man, I wish we had done some really good measurement and building a good foundation of evidence five years ago when we started getting into more digital selling. I wish we had a better body of evidence right now to tell us what worked. So right. absolutely, we can track stuff, we can measure it, we can come to hopefully some pretty good conclusions about what works and what doesn't. Excellent. Um, so those are our four pitfalls that we don't want people to fall into. Um, and, and, and we do have some questions that have started to come in. And, and one of the questions has to do with um, back to the topic of 2008. Um, uh, the question, basically the, the overview of the question is, look, in 2008, uh, we had done something similar. We paired back our sales teams. Um, and then um, after a period of retaining those people, uh, we saw quite a bit of attrition. Um, in 2010. Um, Dave, did, did you see that pattern with your clients where there was some attrition in, in two years after a disruption where we had invested so much time in hanging on to people? And any thoughts about how to mitigate that challenge or just plan for it? Yeah, I can tell you, at the risk of sounding old, I was actually a principal with the Alexander Group back in 2008. <laughs> Uh, but I, but honestly, I don't remember. It's a great question, but I, I don't think that there was any kind of uh, massive attrition or massive turnover that was, you know, dissimilar to any other sort of economic downturn. Uh, so uh, that's my question or my answer, other to that one. Okay, it just might have been localized to this this person's situation. Okay. Um, Let's see, here, here's our next question. It says, sales specialization is well underway and we have an, an inbound and outbound and inside SDRs. One area where many organizations seemingly aren't paying enough attention is around customer success and then capturing the ROI and creating reference stories to drive future sales. What are, uh, what are keys to focus on in post-sales customer success area that we should be considering? Pass that one to Dave. Uh, yeah, I'll take that one again. Sure. Uh, this is a huge issue, and I think it's uh, it was huge pre-pandemic, especially in the tech wor world, where you have these these hybrid companies that are trying to sort of land and expand in the new uh, recurring revenue cloud world. So I think uh, you know part of this is uh, adoption and making sure they're using tools. Part of it is upsell, cross-sell. And then again, I think it gets back to the CSM role. What is the role? Is it customer service? Is it adoption? Is it inbound? Or do I create within that role, and this is a tough one, the sort of um, part-time seller, right? Sort of, I have a quota. I actually am looking to expand. I'm looking in silos within my current client base. So the, the emergence of the post-seller, and this is you know the new you know, customer success manager, CSM, this is it. This is, you know, again, pre-pandemic, huge issue, still a huge issue. And these folks, by the way, have really, and the tech world has not been hurt as much. And these folks were already inside, right? So this is, you know, it's an easy thing to sort of focus on and also for renewals as well. So a uh, great question. And I don't, I, I, I think that there, there's always been sort of an evolution towards this role. And I think it continues, uh, you know, in parallel to the pandemic. 
Right. Can, I, can I throw one other thing on top of that real quick here? Mm -hmm. So um, that is almost the perfect use case for some of these advanced analytics tools. Because one of the things that a AI kind of tool is outstanding at is taking some sort of outcome like customer success, however you want to define it. And if we measure and track things that customers do or salespeople do or you know the environment or behaviors or demographics, if we track all of that stuff, these advanced analytics tools are awesome at figuring out what things have a relationship to the outcome that we care about, like customer success. And so, you know, when we can tease out those trends and let the power of a really sophisticated computational machine tell us what's important, that gives us a lot of potential levers to pull to improve customer success. And then it even could drive some of those front end stories a little bit as well. So that is like number one use case, as far as I'm concerned, that we've talked about so far for a great advanced analytics tool. Yeah, Joel, the thing that I appreciate about the new class of tools is for years, I've brought data to uh, executives and we've had a discussion about that data, but we've all had our own angle, our own rose colored glasses or opinions that we look through when we look at the data and we're looking for things that we've spotted before, right? Yep. Or things that we've experienced before. But the new class of tools that you're talking about just throws all that out and just lets the numbers speak for themselves. And so often they surface things that we would have never thought were correlated one that caused another uh, th uh, things that were interrelated and uh, it, it's uh, it's it's pretty powerful yeah that's right people will say things like well I think that this segment might be op uh, acting differently than this segment so let's look at them differently I'm like eh, let the machine tell us what's true and what's different because that's where the benefit is exactly next question comes from uh, one of our uh, master class uh, students here at sales ops association <laughs> It says, uh, how do you motivate salespeople who are just waiting for things to get better? Uh, they're reluctant to change and adapt. And the follow on question is, are they worth saving if that's their attitude? <laughs> Rob, <laughs> what do you think? No, 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 I'll tell you that one. <laughs> why, why not toss the, the, the sales motivation question to a consummate sales guy, Rob? I mean, come on. <laughs> uh... Yeah, I, I'm not sure I even caught the first part of that. I was just thrown off by the, are they worth saving part? <laughs> um, yeah, how, how do you motivate people who are just waiting for things to get better and really just don't want to change or adapt? Yeah, you know, I've got a couple of those guys on my team. They're, they're sort of, you know, they get their hand out. They're like, where's my leads? You know, what are you, what are you doing for me to, to, for me to hit my quota? And then I've got a couple other people that, you know, will we'll buckle down and, and like water, you know, find the next path to get to where they want to go. It's, it's a tough one, right? I mean, it, it kind of goes back to the, the personalities of the people on your team and what kind of people they are and what they want to want to get involved in. But I think there's, it's like, you know, I guess it's, it's not too dissimilar to when you roll out a new set of compensation plans, right? I mean, you got to sell them. You got, you got to, you got to get them on board with why we're doing this and why they need to get excited about it. And so it's, it, it goes back to, you know, Hey, is this going to be a change? Is this going to be a, an uncomfortable uh, idea for, for some of these folks, well, then you got to put some sort of strategy in place to, to get there. Right. Or, you know, you got to accept the fact that, um, you know, if it's not a, uh, if it's, if you're not evolving towards a place, but you're really a, you know, revolution state, well, then maybe it's, it's, it's an okay thing to see people fall off. And then you need to go figure out where the people are that are going to sign up for this different type of energy. Um, but, you know, I've seen, I've seen companies use it both ways, you know, as, as a way to get, get rid of people that they knew weren't going to get there. And then I've seen them as, uh, okay, well, we need to evolve there over, you know, maybe two years, get to where we want to be. But I know the timelines are shorter these days. It kind of comes down to moving that meaty middle that we talk about all the time, right? We, we know there's that tail that, that are not going to hit and haven't been hitting. And this is a, actually an interesting time to, to, to remove yourself, that, remove that tail if you need to. But on the other end, you've got your super top performers. And I, you know, no matter what some research companies think, I don't necessarily agree that I want to replicate my absolute top performer because they may bring in uh, behaviors to the rest of my team that don't scale so well. <laughs> yeah, but have, I think I think we're, three we're... or four really top performers. You may want to just look are, and see, are they still producing? Because if they are, let them produce because revenue wins right now. <laughs> and you focus on that meaty middle that you know has some opportunity for enhancement and effectiveness and optimization. But take well, a, take a, be careful when you look at your top performers. If they remain your top performers, I, I'd be careful about swinging at them and making them come along just because you think they need to. Yeah. Thoughts? I think well, I was, I, I, 
Go ahead, Rob. No, no, I was, I was actually going to th throw it to what you or, or Dave on that one is that, you know, you talked about the meaty middle and moving it. Well, it's, you know, if you're really shifting the dynamic of the job, right, uh, to a degree, and you say, well, if these guys aren't going to get on board, should we worry about them getting on board? Well, that's, that's really the question the organization has to answer, right? Is it, are these people, people they want to pull along or not? Um, but what do you think? Anyway, I'll, yeah. I'll defer to someone smarter. Yeah. I think um, you, you got to rely on your first line sales manager. That's the leverage point here. He or she has got to figure out who's performing, who's not. And two, in this world, we're going to have a different sales process playbook, which is squarely in the sales operations realm as well. How do we create playbooks? How do we get the stages differently? And last piece, again, is you know, can create a contest here to give a little motivation. Um, so I think there's there's got to be some coaching of the coaches mm -hmm. for for this. And, uh, but in general, you know, I don't think you should hang around if you're just waiting, right? <laughs> not, not a good sign. Yeah, I think the, 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 I think the manager, gonna think, I think, take control here. Yeah, completely. So I, I think I'm going to change the lens a little bit because I'm, I'm living and breathing it as I'm sure a lot of people in our audience and the panelists might as well. Uh, my son's in college and, uh, and, and the teachers there, uh, out of, out of, I think, the 10 classes that he has, two teachers initially refused to post anything at all online. So even the lectures that they traditionally posted online, mm -hmm. they actually went the other way and they said, once you're in class, I'm not gonna post any lectures or anything online. And, and I'm, I'm sure Joel can you know, eventually respond to this one. But there was only two days when the, the Institute shut down because there was a, a, a a threat of a bigger quarter, we'll, we'll post this because we know the, the course is going to suffer. But so the analogy there is, it, it, it's a little bit of a carrot and a stick. Like Dave said, yes, do introduce, you know, some benefits, some additional contests or something. But this professor or these professors happen to be the best in their field. So they are top performers. They may not be in the sales area, but they're still top performers. They're faced by the same challenges. And they have to adapt to a situation that they've never had to do with before. So there was a little bit of, again, like I said, adaptive, right? It's, it's adaptive for everybody, for the customer, for the seller, for the organization, for all the planners, everybody has to learn to be adaptive. And that's how collectively we'll be successful. So it's, it's coaching the coaches and being ready. Hey, if this is what happens, if you don't. Right. You know, I, I, Totally understand that. I have uh, kids in almost all the different age groups from, from middle school all the way through through college. And um, having the teachers come along and, and pivot quickly has been a challenge, a very similar challenge, I understand. And that brings us to the end of our time together. And what I wanted to do was, was thank you all for joining. The next session that we're gonna have in this series is, is really about the topic of virtual selling and how to craft some messaging that you can deliver to your teams that they can then in turn uh, use with their clients in this new world. But we have to get people's attention early. We have to keep it. And it's not the same as if we were sitting in front of them in person. So look for that as a member of this audience. You'll get that invite first. Uh, we'd love to have you in that. And we'd love to have your participation in the Global Sales Ops Association. We're really dedicated to growing the function of sales ops and the careers of the people who serve in it. We have a lot of opportunities for you to get involved, um, visit us and find out more. Thank you for your time today and uh, look forward to seeing you on the next webinar.